you would take out your Bibles and turn to the book of Galatians. We've preached about four messages so far from the book of Galatians. And we're now in chapter 3. Here in a minute we'll give reading to the first couple of verses of that chapter. But I'd like to kind of set the context that Paul's writing in. Remember in the first message we, we set um, the stage per se with Paul's brief definition of the gospel. And that's Christ giving himself for our sins for the purpose of saving us from the present evil age. After that, we saw that Paul said there is no other gospel besides the gospel that I have announced to you. His purpose for saying that, as we'll see today, is that some Judaizers had slipped in and said that Christ is okay, but you need to be circumcised and fulfill the ritual laws of Moses in order to complete your righteousness before God. And so we saw that there is no other gospel but the gospel that Paul preached which is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. After that, we begin to see some of the proofs that Paul was setting before the Galatian believers, proofs that his message was the original message. If Paul wants the Galatians to believe that his message is the best one, then he has to hand out some proof. We saw that his first proof was that he was converted miraculously, and that he did not go immediately to man, but that God, through a revelation in the Lord Jesus Christ, gave him the gospel. Three years later, he went up to Jerusalem, met Peter, stayed with him for a couple of weeks, saw Jesus' brother, but did not have any other fellowship with any of the other apostles or even the churches that heard of him and praised God because of what God was doing through him but did not know him personally. It wasn't until 14 years later that Paul went up to Jerusalem by revelation of the Spirit to present his message to the apostles. They confirmed his message and could add nothing at all to it. Paul had Titus with him, was a Gentile, and the apostles did not require Titus to be circumcised. Last time, we saw the last proof that Paul's gospel is the original gospel. In the fact that seeing Peter's hypocrisy, Paul reproved him before many brethren, and nobody could tell him he was wrong. He was in the right, and Peter had to be in subject to Paul. We also saw that that was a presentation, an expanded presentation of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He expands a little bit more than what he had in, in uh, chapter 1, verse 4. And he said all of those things that we saw last time about being crucified with Christ, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. All of that was directed towards Peter before the brethren. And now in the passage of Scripture that we will see today, Paul turns directly to the Galatians. And he says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? So now that we've kind of remembered what we've gone through so far, if you would, go with me before the presence of our God and Savior, asking for His blessing and His Spirit today. Father, we come before you. We come recognizing that you are holy above all. There is none like you. We recognize that we have sinned and that there is no other way for us to be right with you besides the righteousness of the Lord and Jesus Christ. 
We thank you for providing that righteousness for us so that we would be drawn back to you so that we can now enjoy you and glorify you forever. We thank you for the gospel message. We thank you for this letter to the Galatians. We pray that it would prove to be a blessing in our hearts and in our lives and that you would use it to mold us to the image of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you would work out your eternal purposes through this message today. It is in your Son's precious name that we come before you, seeking to be accepted only because of His righteousness. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and read here Galatians chapter 3. As Paul turns the attention from what he said to Peter in front of the brethren and directs himself to the Galatians. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Paul turns from his experience, and he turns to the experience of the Galatians in order to give them proof that there is nothing to be added to the gospel that Paul had preached to them. Not circumcision and not the ritual laws of Moses. He turns to them and their experience to prove to them that they're wrong. You can say that he even took some of the cultural words or thoughts of the day and even talked about who has bewitched you, which the word is referring to something like who has given you an evil eye. I remember when we were in Mexico that there's a belief that you don't stand there and stare at a baby. If you stare at a baby, it'll get sick. And they say, no le hagas ojo. Don't make him, I mean, don't, just don't look at him, don't stare at him. And so Paul was drawing from something like that from the culture to say, who's... Knocked you off of your rocker? Who has got you um, thinking incorrectly about the gospel? Who has cast a spell on you so that you're turning another way? So that you're going away from the gospel that I taught you? And Paul does so, and Paul directs himself to them in the way of questions. In their rhetorical questions, he doesn't actually provide an answer. And there's a series of questions here. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Did you begin with the Spirit and now you're trying to complete the work in the flesh? And then he kind of, and then he sets before them, have you suffered so many things in vain? In other words, they had suffered because of their belief in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now you're going to go back to the law in order to be made right before God? Does it make sense, brethren? And then he goes back to another rhetorical question, and he says, So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you, do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? And notice he never really answers his questions. He never answers his questions because he knows that the Galatians already know the answer. He knows that they know that as they begin in the Spirit, 
they are to continue in the Spirit. As they began with hearing with faith, by hearing with faith, they are to continue in that way. They know they have not suffered in vain, and they know that if there was somebody gifted to work miracles among them, it was by hearing with faith. He knows that they know this, so he doesn't provide an answer. So we could kind of say that Paul knows that the answer is that the Galatians would give him is, of course, it's by hearing with faith. Paul says, okay, then, since I know that you already know the right answer, verse 6, even so Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Paul lays before them, now turning from their experience, you could say. He's already proved his gospel through his experience. Now he's proving it to them by their experience. And now he's going to turn to the scriptures of the Old Testament to prove that his doctrine, that his gospel is the gospel to be heeded. Is the gospel to be believed and held on to with tenacity. So he begins reflecting on Genesis chapter 15. A passage of scripture that's even after God gave the first call to Abraham. When on a starry night, when Abraham was doubting the promises of God, God calls him out of his tent and says, even as the stars are in the sky, as numerous as the stars are in the sky, your children are going to be just that numerous. And the Bible say in Genesis that he believed God and it was reckoned or counted to him as righteousness. Paul lays before them the main thrust of his gospel message. Now, just to clear up a couple of things. Paul calls them foolish. He's not offending their smarts, their intelligence. He's not doing it that way. He's saying you already know the gospel. I've taught it to you. Don't turn back on that. And we could also say, why does he speak about the Spirit and then jump to Abraham believing God and being justified by faith? Why does he talk about receiving the Spirit? Well, because the Spirit is the seal of God's promise. It is the evidence that we have been justified by faith. That's why he turns and he says, have you received the Spirit? If you receive the Spirit by hearing with faith, then you can't complete the job by works of the law. And after that, he lays the foundation and the thrust for his gospel message which is rooted in the Old Testament and rooted in the promise of God given to Abraham. Let's go ahead and read now the next section, verses 7 through 9 in Galatians chapter 3. <clears throat> Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. Paul uses the Galatians' experience to take them to the fact that the blessing comes by faith and by faith Alone, Paul takes them to the covenant of promise, the covenant of Abraham. And he does it with a purpose. Notice the particular word blessed in this portion of scripture. All the nations will be blessed in you. And then again in verse 9. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. He is going back to 
to the Old Testament Scriptures to teach them that His Gospel has roots that are given even in the Old Testament. That the promise was given to Abraham. And that Christ and His Gospel is a fulfillment of the promise given to Abraham. He sets before them the blessing so they can see where the blessing's at. So that they don't go back, as we'll see in a moment, to where the curse is. But as we talk about blessings, we'll make a little application here. Isn't it true that the Bible has to teach us what true blessedness is? We're very tempted to think of our circumstances as even being blessings or cursings. But the Bible even directs us that because our understanding of the world as it is has been so clouded because of sin that we don't even know where true blessing is found. So the scripture says you want to be blessed. Let me show you where true blessing is at. Now all good gifts come from God. But true blessing, the greatest blessing that we could ever have, and a blessing that no one can take from us, even though we may be going through dire situations and terrible and have terrible circumstances, the blessings that nobody can take from us is the blessing that the gospel provides. If you would, take your Bible and turn with me to another one of Paul's letters. Romans chapter 4. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because it's not the thrust of the text, but I think it is a needed application, a useful application. Romans chapter 4. And we can go ahead and read verses 6 through 8. Paul has presented to the Roman believers that those that do not work but believe in the God that justifies the ungodly. Verse 5, his faith is credited as righteousness. And then to support that, he goes once again to the Old Testament. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Where is true blessing found? True blessing is found in a right stance before God. Blessing is found, true blessing, the greatest blessing is found in being made right with God through Christ, by faith alone. Now that's not to say that people don't go through suffering. And that's not to to not address that issue. Because there are issues to be seen. Suffering is real. But the truth of the matter is, we all suffer in different ways. But if we lay hold of true blessedness, then even our circumstances can't take that blessing from us. Paul makes this move, and he makes this move for a purpose. He says blessing is found by faith and it's found in being made right before God because of Christ's righteousness only through faith. Why does he do that? He does so to present to the Galatian believers why they should not turn back to the law in order to complete their righteousness before God. Let's go now to Galatians chapter 3. Go ahead and go back to there. And we'll read verses 10 through 14. 
For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So Paul once again, takes the Galatian believers after laying out his experience. My gospel is a true gospel because of this, this, and this. Now, in your experience, you've received the Spirit by faith. You began that way, so continue that way. Why? Because true blessing is found by faith in the promises of God. Like the covenant I made with Ab- with it, God made with Abraham. And Christ is the fulfillment of that covenant. That's where true blessing is at. Don't go back to the law like the Judaizers are trying to make you go and be circumcised and practice all the food laws and do this, that, and the other to try to perfect or to complete your righteousness before God. Because the law was not given to justify sinners. That's not the purpose of the law. God never gave his law to save directly or to make righteous. God gave his law, as we'll see next time, for a certain purpose. One of them is to bring the sinner to Christ. So we don't go to the law, Paul says, to be justified. So if you began by the Spirit, then why are you going to try to be fulfilled in the flesh? The flesh there may very well be, Paul may very well be uh, alluding back to circumcision. Why are you going to try to be perfect in the flesh, in your physical body, with some ritual that served its purpose for a time, but that's not where true blessing is found at eternally. The true blessing is the gospel that was preached beforehand to Abraham. That's where blessing is at, by faith. Being made righteous before a holy God because Christ was righteous and holy. And by faith we receive that righteousness before God. I'd like to make some applications. And then we'll be finished. We're not going to read the first verses of chapter 3 once again. But I want to take our thoughts back to there. What would Paul write to Dallas Reformed Baptist Church? What would Paul write to you personally and individually as a believer? What would Paul write to our church if he came to be among us for a month to see how our life and our ministry was? What would Paul write, and I'm preaching to myself, what would Paul write about what comes from this pulpit? Would he write as he wrote to the Galatians, you foolish believers in Dallas, who has bewitched you? Why, if you begin by faith, if you've received the Spirit by hearing with faith, then why are you trying to finish in the flesh? Or would he say to us, you're doing pretty good. Of course, there's some things that aren't quite right. But 
Are you seeking to emphasize these things? That having begun in the Spirit, we continue in the Spirit by faith? What would he say to us individually? Would he say that we've been bewitched? That we've been deceived? And that we're now seeking to be made right before God? By what we can do? Or by rituals of the law of Moses? Or seeking justification anywhere else outside of Christ? Seeking forgiveness outside of Him? Or seeking to to weave a robe of righteousness in some other way than what the gospel has presented to us? Would he say that we've been bewitched personally as a congregation? I pray that we would really look at this and take this seriously because Paul does not denounce with such seriousness in really any other letter. Not to the degree that what he says in Galatians chapter 1. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. That is strong language. It's pretty much equivalent to let them suffer eternal damnation. Turning from the gospel is serious business. Seeking to be made righteous before a holy God is serious business. How are you seeking it? In Christ by faith is the answer, the right answer, and only there. Paul later on in his letter, of course we'll get to how we walk and how we grow in holiness as believers, which is the evidence of being justified by faith. But here, he's still anchoring down on this core gospel message of how the sinner is made right before God. As we'll see later on, the law is not evil. The law is good. Paul in another place says that the law and the commandments are holy, just, and good. So, we're not to take that idea from the message today. The law takes us to Christ. It teaches us that outside of Christ, we're under a curse. And it takes us to the one who redeemed us from the curse. Let's read verse 13 again. Galatians 3.13 Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So the law presents to us the condition of a man, of a woman, of a boy, or of a girl that is outside of Christ. As one being under the curse, under a law that says, do this and you shall live. But it also says, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. The law, if we seek to be made righteous by it, leaves not one little inch, no room for error at all. But the strictness of the law leads us to Christ, to see the glories of his cross. That the curse that the law denounces on sinners, Christ took it on himself. And the Bible actually said that he was made 
having become a curse for us. And then Paul, once again, bases his conclusion on the Old Testament. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And Christ hung on a tree in our place. So now if we're in Christ, we're no longer under the curse. We can see throughout the whole letter up to this point, Paul's emphasis on the cross. In chapter 1, verse 4, Talks about Christ that gave himself for our sins in order to free us or liberate us like God liberated Israel from Egypt. Christ liberates us spiritually from the present evil age. Chapter 2, verse 20 I am crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live the cross again. Paul says that the gospel message is a public portrayal of Christ as crucified. So only in the gospel, only in the cross, do we have freedom from the present evil age, from sin. Only in the cross do we live and have life before a holy God. The cross is the gospel message. And then through the cross, Christ redeems us from the curse of the law. Without a doubt, a central part, if the central part of the gospel of Paul is the cross. A gospel without a cross is not a gospel. has no good news. So what is your focus? If Paul's focus is the cross, what is our focus? Let's bring this down once again to our individual selves and to our church. If we're seeking to be freed from the present evil age, do we think of the cross? If we're seeking to live before God, Do we think of the cross? When we think of the gospel, do we think of the cross? When we think of of, of forgiveness of sins, do we think of the cross? If we think about our identity as believers, do we think in the cross? Paul constantly takes all of these things back to the cross. Dead to sin, but alive to God. Where? In Christ. Why? Why? Because he died to sin on the cross. And because he was risen from the grave. Where do you find a right standing before God? The cross. And the cross alone. I'd like to just make a couple of comments and then we'll be finished. Do we see the glory of our Savior through the cross. Doesn't it make you think a little bit about our Savior? Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. How? Having become a curse for us. Because he hung on the tree. He hung on the cross. The glory is that we were made for Christ. Christ made us. He made us for His glory. But we did not live for His glory. We fell into sin. 
And he that was sinned against was willing to forgive, but not without a price to pay. There had to be a price paid. God's glory was offended. And God will not hold the guilty as innocent. That would be unjust and unholy of him. So Christ took our place on the tree. And he died beneath the wrath of God and the curse of the law. So that we would now be brought back to a right standing with God so that we can now begin to fulfill the purpose for which God made us, which is to glorify Christ. If you're here without Christ, come to the cross. If you have a confession of being a Christian, if you began right, Continue right. And don't seek to work out a righteousness of your own. Come constantly to Christ. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. Words are too weak to portray you and to portray the glory of Christ as is, as is deserved. But I pray that you would take this humble attempt and that you would use it in our lives and in our hearts. We pray that through the gospel message we would be molded into the image of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, so that we reflect Him to the world in which we live. We pray that you would bless us with your original purpose for us, that we would live for Christ and for His glory. Thank You for the cross. You reveal more of who You are in the cross than You do anywhere else. Yes, You're seen as good in creation. But when we think of the cross, there's nothing that compares to the glory of your righteousness that would not look over one of the sins of your people. We see your love at the cross. We see your grace at the cross. We pray that the cross would be at the center of who we are as individuals and at the center of who we are as a church. Please bless this message to our hearts and to our souls. In Christ's blessed name, we come before you. Amen. Amen.